Let me just share with you quickly how I got started. You would never imagine this. In 1982, when I was finishing up my Harvard Master's in Public Health, and I was asked, would I, would like, to, would I like to participate in educating gay folks and others about this thing called gay-related immune deficiency? This was before it was called AIDS. And I said, nah, I don't want to deal with that disease at all. I don't want to think about that at all. Here I am. 15 years later, 16 years later, and what am I doing? Traveling around the world, telling people about the man-made origins of AIDS and Ebola. I was working over here. My favorite area of, of research and teaching was in self-care, healthy human development, motivational psychology, teaching people, like Danny does, how to take better care of themselves, boost their immune systems. So I was really into that. I love that. That's my favorite thing. And one day, Kind of like the miracle happened where there was a crisis and I was the right person at the right time. It was the 1990, July 27th, 1990, when the case of the Florida dental AIDS tragedy hit the press. You remember the case of the Florida dentist who infected his patients with the AIDS virus? And three years at that time, I was serving as the world's leading dental and medical catalog supply company's chief professional advisor. And my background was in media, health education, health promotion, fear, because I worked on dental phobia reduction therapy programs, behavioral therapy programs to allay people's fear, going to the dentist. And I had been a dentist for 16 years in health education and media, persuasion, technologies. And here the media was making so many people afraid to go see their dentist in the wake of this case. So I was asked, I was told, I was given the job, opportunity to develop patient educational literature to help allay people's fear of going into dental medical practices. So I started to research. The Centers for Disease Control's official investigation reports on the case, I first found them to be scientifically questionable. I then found them to be scientifically bogus, and then later found them to be fraudulent. They had literally covered up, deleted the most incriminating evidence against the dentist who I had to conclude after three years of studying this case and publishing three scientific reports, literally having to go out of the United States to publish because the American Dental Association, American Medical Association wanted to maintain a cover-up. And I wrote a book that was based on those three scientific reports called Deadly Innocence, my ninth book, wherein I had to conclude that the dentist, based on all the evidence, using the FBI's own behavioral science literature, how they themselves investigate and evaluate these types of cases, that this dentist, scientifically trained, military dentist for much of his career, very intelligent dentist, believed that he was dying of a virus that the government had created. They covered that up. He believed that they had intentionally injected this virus during a 1978 experimental hepatitis B vaccine that was given to a lover of his that he had in 1985. And that's how he got infected. And he believed that this was genocide. And he believed in what was called the World Health Organization Theory of AIDS. The videotape that Danny stated he saw, the Strecker Memorandum, was what Dr. David Acker believed that the World Health Organization, the United States Public Health Service, Centers for Disease Control had something to do with the development of these types of viruses and the deployment of them through hepatitis B and other vaccines in Africa and North America. In essence, I have to conclude at the end of that case that the dentist most plausibly was an identical to an organized serial killer. He maintained a classic organized serial killer personality. You know like the Unabomber? These people, they all, according to the FBI, kill for the sake of power, control, and revenge. Revenge being the major theme. And the principal issue, his principal vendetta was screaming loud and clear in the legal testimonies. It was the, against the federal government. In essence, I concluded that he created a crime. He did what all organized serial killers love to do. They manipulate the authorities into Catch-22s. The Unabomber, he publishes his manifesto in the New York Times, Washington Post. He says, here's what I believe. You try to get me. David Acker, the Florida dentist, was virtually identical to this. In essence, he created a crime, a mystery that could not be solved without implicating the government. Because if they told the truth, if they said he was an organized serial killer, then the whole world would want no motive. And the motive was screaming loud and clear in the legal testimony, which they buried. So,
There was one document, however, that came along with that videotape called the Strecker Memorandum that Strecker sent to David Acker. And it was the most horrifying document I had ever seen. It was a 1970 Department of Defense appropriations request for $10 million for a five-year study to develop immune system ravaging microorganisms for germ warfare. And it said right in this document that the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council, the most esteemed of all health science agencies in America, not only informed the Department of Defense that, quote, over the next five to ten years it will be possible to make a new infective microorganism that could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease causing microorganism. And most important of these is that it would be refractory to the immunologic and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious diseases, end quote. And they not only told the Department of Defense that, this esteemed health science agency, but that, and that they would cost them $2 million a year over five years to do it, but that they would help them to do it. So I believed our government at the time was not particularly trustworthy, but you know, I could not imagine that this document was legitimate. I lived in denial, like most people, most Americans, most people worldwide are living in denial today because they are so brainwashed, they are brain dead. I lived in denial just like that. I said, okay, I've, seen, I've heard some weird things, but here I'm looking at this and it looks legitimate. So what do I do? All I know now is I've got the World Health Organization theory and I've got this document I know perhaps maybe if this look, document is legitimate, and indeed it was. In fact, what they were looking for specifically was in the congressional record, this was in the congressional record, they were looking for a, quote, super germ, end quote. That word was in the congressional record. That could wipe out the human being's immune system, the defense system against infectious disease and diseases, leaving us, human beings, susceptible to the opportunistic infections like tuberculosis, like candidiasis, like yeast infections, like pneumonia, and like cancers. So this is what they're looking at. So ultimately, what did I do? I went back to Harvard's Countway Medical Library, where I did most of my postdoctoral research. And I go to the World Health Organization Chronicle Files, and where do I begin? I start in 1965. Why? I figure, well, if the money maybe kicked in in 1970, let me go five years before that and five years after that. And so, I start by pulling World Health Organization Chronicle, their monthly journal, off the shelves and I begin to read what they are involved in. And I was surprised as a public health professional who over the previous five years had four times presented scientific papers at the American Dental Public Health Association meeting, I knew very little about the World Health Organization. Astonishing. I found out that this was like the godfather to the pharmaceutical industry. That they create the standards upon which the pharmaceuticals and the drugs, including the vaccines, are based. And they largely, I learned, helped to determine which drugs remain legal and which ones would be illegal. It took me a while before I learned that this organization was largely controlled by the Rockefellers. But you see, by 1965, they had already had about five to seven years under their belt in what was called the Virus Cancer Research Network. They were developing a cancer virus research network. And that by 1970, they reported <clears throat> that they had isolated well over 70,000 different strains of viruses. And when they said, quote, isolated, unquote, it took me a, another few weeks and months before I learned that what they really meant to say was mutated, recombined, hybridized isolates. And that by 1970, they reported having distributed these 70,000 different strains of viruses to well over 500 research laboratories throughout the world. And among their principal distributors of these viruses was none other than the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And you see, when I saw that it was the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, 
a red flag came up for me. If you folks want to dim the light or turn this light off, just if that's not too much of a problem, just for a couple minutes while I talk about a little bit of the slides. You see, this is the home of the infamous Dr. Robert Gallo, who allegedly discovered the AIDS virus in 1984. You remember this? This was the, when the, what prompted the French-American AIDS practice. It was turned out that within weeks of Dr. Robert Gallo and Margaret Heckler announcing Dr. Gallo's find a feather in the cap of American medicine, doctor at the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Robert Gallo, discovered the cause of AIDS. It's a virus. Then the United States patented everything having to do with AIDS, virus research, and testing. And then France ended up suing the United States when shortly thereafter it was determined that Gallo cloned, stole Luc Montaigne's virus from France, and France ended up suing the United States. It was resolved about a couple years ago when around the same time President Clinton pardoned Robert Gallo for scientific misconduct on another unrelated matter. Whenever does a president of the United States pardon a health scientist? That's a little weird. But it happened to be the fourth time in three decades that Dr. Robert Gallo had been investigated for scientific misconduct and or fraud and had escaped, gotten off. So I immediately began to suspect Dr. Robert Gallo. I said, well, maybe I should go look at, see what Robert Gallo was doing between 1965 and 19, 1975. And so I go back and I look up Gallo in Index Medicus, Harvard's County Medical Library. And what you see here is one of six pages. It's called the Scientific Literature Review that I've reprinted in the book, Emerging Viruses, AIDS, and Ebola, where there was nothing in 65 that Gallo published. There was nothing in 66, 67, there were two publications. 68, there were four, 60, um, 69, there were two, 70, there were three, and 71, there were eight. Aha, just a coincidence, you see, that as the money kicked in for the Department of Defense, Robert Gallo's laboratory output more than doubled. Coincidence, maybe, maybe not. And I began to read, and what were these people writing? Well, they were studying things that are very Suspicious indeed. Here, this is from the journal Nature. By the way, because of what I am telling you, you also know to be so unbelievable. The concept that the United States government had something to do with the development of immune system ravaging viruses, AIDS virus, Ebola virus, that most people can't believe this. See, as a behavioral scientist, as a behavioral science expert, I knew most human beings who evolved, who developed, because of loving parents who instilled ethics and morals and values could not conceive of this level of evil, that they would never believe it. If you leave here today, I guarantee you, nine out of 10 people that you speak and you tell them about this, you will see a window shade of disbelief come across their eyes and you know you're no longer talking to a human being with ears. <laughs> and so knowing that ahead of time, as a behavioral science expert, I said, I got to reprint the most incriminating documents so that it is totally there. It is no question. And so this is one of numerous documents that you see reprinted in the book, Emerging Viruses, AIDS, and Ebola, where this is from the journal Nature, 1970. And you see Robert C. Gallo from the National Cancer Institute. You see Robert C. Ting, Robert C. Ting from Bionetics Research Labs, Bethesda, Maryland. And it turned out that about a third of what Dr. Robert Gallo published, he published with Bionetics researchers. Have you ever heard of Litton Industries, folks? You know, Litton has L-I-T-T-O-N. They have uh, microwave ovens. A lot of people know them from their microwave ovens. But besides microwave ovens, they're a highly diversified company. They're heavily involved. Interestingly enough, they are among always the leader, leading military weapons contractors for the world. And they had a subsidiary, a medical subsidiary called Litton Bionetics, Bionetics Research Labs, which was a documented biological weapons contractor. And you see that Dr. Robert Gallo, about a third of 25% to 30% of what he published, he published, co-authored with these people. Now here what they're studying, without getting too technical, is an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It's actually, the technical name is RNA-dependent DNA polymerase of human acute leukemic cells. That is a unique enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It calls for life to operate in reverse, this enzyme does. 
what in God's universe calls for life to operate in reverse? Something satanic, in my opinion, don't you think? Well, you see, that's exactly what this enzyme does. You see, typically God created everything in the universe, in particular life, all forms of life, to operate out of the same unique, magnificent system designed to perfection beyond the reaches of the wildest imaginations. And it's all based. He created this thing called DNA, the blueprint of life, the code. And you see, in God's magnificent cells and tissues, what it calls for is that DNA is to be taken, and from DNA, this blueprint, new RNA is created, which then serves to bring and establish proteins, amino acids and proteins, to the protein manufacturing station of the cell called the ribosome. And it is here where proteins are built, new cell parts are built, and new cells, healthy, happy cells evolve. So it goes, the God's magnificent system goes DNA to RNA to new proteins to new cell parts to new life. This enzyme says, uh-uh, we're not going to have that anymore. We're going to go backwards. We're going to take a single strand of RNA that the virus is going to present. And because of the presence of this unique reverse transcriptase, a new DNA strand gets created. It's called a DNA provirus. And because of the presence of another very interesting enzyme, it's called an endonuclease. It's like a scissors. It cuts open God's magnificent code for life. And it allows this new DNA strand to get inserted so that now when the perfect cell begins to read this code, this message for how to create new life, it gets fooled. It calls for the production of more viruses instead of healthy cell parts. <clears throat> and that these viruses butt off the cells. And because of these unique proteins on the outside membrane, they're called GP120-like proteins, like little balls here, you see? Through lock and key fashion, they seek out other cells, CD4 helper cells, T lymphocytes, the quarterbacks of the immune system. And they attach to these and they continue this process. Now. This is being done by Robert Gallo and his associates from Bionetics Research, and they're studying this in acute, human acute, that's quick-acting leukemia cells. This is in 1970, folks. This is 14 years before this man allegedly discovered the first AIDS virus. This is the enzyme that makes the AIDS virus tick. This is also the enzyme that makes the leukemia virus work. And this is nine years before this man allegedly discovered the first leukemia virus, HTLV-1. And, as I said, his co-authors from Lytton Bionetics just happened to be sixth on the list of major Army biological weapons contractors at that time. This is directly from the United States Congressional Record. And as you see also, for those sitting in front, and highlighted in yellow, is the New York University Medical Center. Remember that. I'm going to come back to that there will be a quiz at the end of this program. <laughs> and those who fail the quiz, it may cost you your life, literally. So, what else were they doing? And publishing. Well, they were the world's preeminent experts in monkey cancer virus research. And what they were doing in not only monkeys, but primates, man as well, was they were taking these viruses that they knew would cause cancer. For example, they took woolly monkey viruses and rhesus monkey viruses, including this thing called SV40, simian virus 40. It was the 40th monkey virus ever discovered. And you see, this virus was discovered by a really wonderful human being, a wonderful woman by the name of Bernice Eddy. She found it in the Salk and Sabin polio vaccines, late 50s, early 60s. She inoculated this vaccine containing SV40 into virtually every animal, and the animals started to die. She inoculated a dozen monkeys with these. All monkeys killed, killed over, paralyzed, or dead. She took photographs. She presented the photographs to the National Institute of Health Director, who confiscated the photos and then proceeded to de demote and defund this woman. 
took her 10 years before she struggled in a crusade to get to Congress. And in front of Congress, she said to the congressman, 1972, she says, if you continue to allow these contaminated vaccines to go out, I guarantee you over the next 20 years, you will have epidemics of cancer unlike the world has ever seen. It's come to pass, hasn't it? They didn't listen to her. But you see that this particular virus, I want you to know a horrifying reality for your health and for your children's lives, that this particular virus, to this very day, contaminates the oral polio vaccine that we are allegedly by law required to give our children. In fact, your FDA has to turn a blind eye to as many as 100 simian monkey virus contaminants per dose that we are allegedly by law required to give our kids. And you know why they don't tell you? They can't even tell health scientists the truth. So physicians never know, and the public never gets a clue. The reason that they don't tell you is their hands are tied by proprietary laws and non-disclosure agreements placed upon them by the pharmaceutical companies. They are muzzled by the drug makers. So they were taking this end, they took this virus, they took a number of other viruses, and they took human lymphoma viruses that they knew would cause cancer of the lymph nodes. And they began to recombine these with virtually every animal cancer virus known. Their favorite ones to work with was the feline leukemia virus RNA. This caused a whole laundry list of symptoms virtually identical to what AIDS patients suffer from. By the way, if you're a cat lover out there and you've lost cats to feline leukemia, sorry to tell you that the experts at the time said also, feline leukemia is man-made. They were recombining cat and human viruses, and they were doing all sorts of bizarre things. They also, their other favorite one to take was chicken leukemia, chicken leukemia sarcoma virus RNA. That caused wasting immunosuppression and death. And so you see, when they were around here with this mutant hybrid, in order to get this to jump species into humans, it still needed another major mutation. To get it to jump species readily, they reported culturing it in human white blood cells in some studies and human fetal tissue cells in culture in other studies so that it would adapt. It would develop those unique proteins on the outside membrane called GP120-like proteins so that it could attach to the human cells, be carried across the cell membranes, enter the gene of the cell, and then do virtually everything that the AIDS virus does. Now, they not only reported that, they reported where they presented that work. Some of it was reported in Mall, Belgium in 1970 in front of NATO military scientists. So when I had the great fortune and privilege blessing of becoming the first investigator in the history of the esteemed International AIDS Conference on July 10th of last year to present and defend during a scientific session a paper stating that these viruses, HIV and its relatives, are undoubtedly man-made laboratory creations. You didn't hear about that, did you? No. Interestingly enough, we had put out press releases, we put out copies of the paper, we had invitations to all of the media, all the Canadian media, all the American media. The Canadian media showed up in mass. I made it on every news radio station in Canada, every wire service in Canada, every newspaper, including the conservative Globe and Mail, carried at least short stories, some feature articles. CBC, Canadian television, filmed me, but they never showed it. But you know what? No one from the United States news media came. So if you think today that the American news media is not largely controlled, I think it's time that you have your brain examined. Right. So, but anyway, I had the privilege of presenting this research in front of some of the world's leading epidemiologists and AIDS experts and virologists who came to my presentation, many of them, and so they were arguing with me. Some of them said, well, so what, Dr. Horowitz? So they had, were working on reverse transcriptase at that time. That doesn't mean anything. I said, okay, I can appreciate that. And then I showed them the congressional record, and they said, oh, that is interesting that they're sixth on the list of major Army biological weapons contractors. And I showed them the other material that I just showed you about combining monkey viruses and cat monkey. And they said, oh, that is very strange. How do we know you're not telling us falsehoods? How do we know you're not making this up? I said, well, if you truly are interested, you can look up my references, which I have both in the book and in this paper. You can look it up for yourselves. And I said, but I might save you the time. And I then handed them 
a government document, which explains exactly what I'm about to show you here. And I said, you read this. And then he asked me, answer me this question, whether or not you think this might be risky to humanity. And I'll ask you the same question, and you see how you vote. Here's what they're doing. Besides biological weapons contractors, they are also working under the cover of National Cancer Institute research. They're also investigating whether viruses cause cancer in humans. They weren't sure, for, or at least they said that they weren't sure. I suspect now they were pretty sure. They also wanted to study whether vaccines could prevent viral induced cancers. And here, in this particular study, they were looking at whether they could diagnose these viruses in the human tissues early in order to prevent them. You know, like breast screenings or pap screenings, pap smears, where you, if you identify a problem early enough, you can perhaps save a life. Hey, we can't fault these folks for doing that type of research. But here, the question is, do you think this type of research is risky? To begin, to develop an alternative approach for the detection of possible human leukemia viruses. They begin with a mouse sarcoma virus that caused sarcoma cancers in mice. And they recombined it with a mouse leukemia virus to create a mouse leukemia sarcoma virus hybrid that they then inoculated into healthy cats to get it to jump species from mouse to cat. Now they had a mouse leukemia sarcoma virus that was infectious for cats, which they then inoculated into a cat suffering from feline leukemia, cat leukemia. And you know what? Success! It worked, they reported. Next step, they report, take the same mutant hybrid, culture it through human embryonic cells, and then get it to jump species, therefore, it to humans, and then try it on a human being suffering with leukemia. Now, how many of you raise your hands if you think that this might be risky to the huma human race? Raise your hands. Okay, well, we got 100% in that, that question. I want you to know that although most of you represent a lay audience, there's some health professionals, health scientists perhaps here, but I want you to know that you concur with some of the world's leading AIDS epidemiologists, virologists, and cancer virus experts, who when I showed them this and they read this, many of them, most of them, shook their heads. Some of them said, this is extremely risky. Some of them said, I can't believe they were doing this. This is mad. So this is what they were doing. Now, this was my thesis. I presented it. And one of the smoking guns in the book Emerging Viruses, AIDS, and Ebola was that the specific cancer virus immune suppression complex that these people spent most of their time and money studying during the highly funded and mostly secret special virus cancer program. Those of you who have been in the military know the word special means. It means covert, secret, virus, cancer program was, what they were studying mostly, was the immune suppression, leukemia, lymphoma, sarcoma, cancer complex that never existed on planet Earth in human beings before 1978 with the outbreak of the first AIDS cases in New York and simultaneously Central Africa. So that is one of numerous smoking guns that we have. But, you know, when I presented this work, I had a story to tell you. Kind of a very fascinating story, a little bit disturbing. You've heard of Gulf War Syndrome, haven't you? It overlaps Gulf War Syndrome. I was in town doing radio interviews, as I said, in Canada. And there was a documentary film crew filming a vaccine documentary that asked if they could film my interview with Fanny Kiefer, one of Vancouver's leading talk show hosts. And I said, sure, be happy, come on. So uh, they filmed me at the end of the interview the producer came up to me and said, Dr. Horowitz, did you know that Dr. Robert Gallo is in town this week? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't know that. She says, yes, indeed, he's giving a public forum, public presentation, wherein the audience is invited to ask questions. Would you like to come and ask Dr. Gallo a question? <laughs> so, you know, of course, those little horns pierced my scalp, you see. And uh, so the next night, in front of about 300 Canadians, Canadian press, and a documentary film crew, I asked Dr. Gallo the following question. I said, Dr. Gallo, are you at all concerned that your early research using 
monkey viruses like SV40 and others, and recombining these with things like feline leukemia virus RNA and chicken leukemia sarcoma virus RNA might have given rise to the AIDS virus or AIDS virus relatives that might have contaminated chimpanzees and rhesus monkeys shipped by your colleagues from Lytton Bionetics to the vaccine manufacturers at Merck Sharp and Dome. He got angry. He got really angry. First of all, he denied doing it. He says, oh, we, oh, you know what you're talking about. We never did anything. I, said, I had a microphone like this. I said, excuse me, Dr. Gallo, I could cite your papers. He says, well, if you can cite my papers, then you got a paper I don't know about. You go right ahead. I said, OK. Adamson, Herrera, Gallo, at all proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, 1970. In fact, Dr. Gallo, you might recall, we're presenting this paper orally in front of NATO military scientists in Mall, Belgium. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Yes, indeed. I do remember being in Mall, Belgium. It was the first time I was in Europe. I, uh, at the time, I can remember it very clearly. He's hemming and hawing. He says, but I want you to know that NATO funds all sorts of meetings, meetings about motherhood, fatherhood, sisterhood, and brotherhood. And we were never really doing that type of research. I said, excuse me, Dr. Gallo, how about the Sarin Gallo at all where you published in Nature New Biology, recombining these different types of viruses to study the unique immune suppression leukemia lymphoma sarcoma complex models? He says, we weren't, doing, we weren't doing that. We weren't doing that. You don't know what you're talking about. What you're talking about is like mixing apples and oranges, peaches and plums, and other tutti frutti. <laughs> And the response that you just had was exactly the response that the Canadian audience had. So, and he says that you, young man, should go back and get a grade 101 level of biological science training, high school level. And with that, the Canadian audience applauded, and I sat down. Well, a couple minutes later, of course, Gallo apologized to the audience. He said he had a low-grade fever that day. He wasn't feeling well, which is a standard public relations ploy when you lose your cool big time. <laughs> so so uh, a couple minutes later, he's escorted out in a huff, surrounded by two very large, well-dressed gentlemen. One hands out a card to a colleague of mine and says, Vice President of Hill and Knowlton Public Relations. People who are in public relations, advertising industry, know that Hill and Knowlton is one of the world's leading public relations firms. And this is the public relations firm, by the way, that... Uh, that uh, the Bush administration employed to get us involved in the Gulf War. Because we, as Americans, patriotic Americans included, we don't like sending our troops off to foreign lands to die. So we need persuasion, you see. We need to be persuaded. So Bush administration hired Hill and Knowlton to develop a persuasion campaign. And their first commercial on the air was where they got a Kuwaiti prince's niece and they filmed her lying saying that she saw witness Saddam Hussein's elite guardsmen torturing and maiming babies and pulling them from incubators and throwing them out of windows and we Americans aghast said this is disgusting how could they do that and then public opinion for the war rose and Bush said this aggression shall not stand and then they inoculated 700,000 of our finest men and women to go off and a few years a little while later Many of them come back, 200, 300,000 of them come back with Gulf War syndrome. 20, approximately 20,000, 30,000 perhaps have already have died. Many of their children have been born without limbs. It's been spreading. And so you see that <clears throat> counterintelligence propaganda, you know, and it was found, it was only found afterwards that Hill and Knowlton had lied, that this was a whole lie. It was a complete hoax. Never happened. But you see, counterintelligence propaganda like this runs with two basic techniques. One is the technique of giving you, let's say, 80% of the truth, peppered with 10 to 20% of lies or disinformation, or 10% to 20% that they leave out, that if you had that 10 to 20% of the most important facts, it would present a completely new picture of what the real story is. So, What's the 10 to 20% that they're not telling you here? Well, here's what they're not telling you. You see, first you have the Pentagon denying. Pentagon denying that they would be suffering from anything, these people. 
Then, when they couldn't deny it any longer, they said it's in their minds, it's post-war st stress and fatigue. And then when they couldn't deny that, and pictures of the chemical waste dump explosion started to come out in the, not in the mainstream media yet, but they felt pressure. They had to come out with some other story. So what did they tell us? They told us that uh, physiostigmine, chemicals, drugs, organophosphates, these people were given new drugs, new chemicals that were combined for the first time and caused side effects. And then the Pentagon, after more information started to come out, and they realized that they had these records. They were supposed to be holding records of the chemical and biological exposures over in the Middle East that the troops sustained. And that, interestingly enough, many if not most of those records were blown up during the Oklahoma City bombing. And you see that now the CIA had to get involved. Rather than tell that horrifying reality story, the CIA comes along and says, no, 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 the Pentagon is covering up. And what do they do? They tell you, look over here, mirror, smoke and mirror over here. What are they covering up? What they're covering up is that the troops were exposed to chemical and perhaps biological weapons as the Scud missiles were being blown out of the sky by the Patriot missiles. It was raining down on these troops. And when they blew up the chemical dumps, the wind carried the exposures. And that's what the CIA says. The Pentagon's covering up, and the Pentagon's saying, no, 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 the CIA doesn't know what they're talking about. And neither one is telling you the fact is that vaccines, contaminated vaccines, were most plausibly the originator of Gulf War syndrome. Why? Because it's the only thing that explains why some people who went over to the Gulf War arena who got exposed, didn't get Gulf War syndrome, whereas some people who didn't go over there got it. Here's what happens, you see. When you're given a contaminated vaccine lot, they create vaccine lots. Some lots are more contaminated than others. Some doses of the contaminated lots are more contaminated than others. So if you just happen to get a contaminated dose, then guess what happens to your immune system? Goes down. You get weakened. You're susceptible to infectious diseases, susceptible to multiple drug chemical interactions. Wreaks havoc on your body. This is what they're not telling you. Schwarzkopf had let it, let it slip one day, a couple months back in Las Vegas. He finally came out and said it was vaccines, he believes, that, that initiated it. And he's right. But what they're not telling you is that that vaccine, most of those vaccines, or at least many of those vaccines, were developed in Tanox by Tanox Biomedical Systems Corporation of Houston, Texas, co-owned by James Baker III, Secretary of State under George Bush, major shareholder, George Bush, and that they tested that vaccine in Huntsville, Texas, in the Huntsville prison population, and the prisoners developed Gulf War syndrome long before the Gulf War. And because it's an infectious disease, partly, the prisoners gave it to the guards. And I was in Huntsville, Texas, about four or five months ago. And the guards brought it home and gave it to their spouses. And the spouses and the guards gave it to their children. And now they're spreading it to their healthcare professionals. And this you're not hearing a word about. So these are the people that lead Dr. Robert Gallo out. And as he gets out, somebody shortly thereafter hands him a flyer on the book Emerging Viruses, AIDS, and Ebola, wherein he sees the name, he recognizes the name, forward by W. John Martin, MD, PhD. And he recognizes that name, not only as one of the world's leading vaccine contamination analysts who worked at the FDA, top man in their Bureau of Biologics, in charge of testing human vaccines for contamination between 1976 and 1980. But he recognizes Martin also as the guy who rented a room in his house for many moons while he was living on the East Coast. And he recognizes the name because he had just been in Martin's lab a few weeks earlier, trying to find out what Martin was up to. Because Gal, you see, of taxpayer money, was given $12.5 million new contract and a $50 million research laboratory affiliated with the University of Maryland called the Institute for Human Virology. So, he recognizes also on the back of the flyer, in the back of the book, the name Garth Nicholson. 
as a colleague of his, a personal friend. Nicholson is the hero to Gulf War Syndrome veterans. He's the guy who's been really at the forefront in telling the research community the truth. And as a result, he was pressured to leave his academic post at MD Anderson Cancer Research Center, where he was Gallo's counterpart, chief man in cancer virology and cancer studies. And they both worked intimately with the special virus cancer program researchers at Fort Detrick. And Nicholson wrote, one cannot fail to grasp the explosive significance of this book and its main thesis, that biological weapons programs developed and field tested immune system destroying agents that now cannot be contained. A cogent, readable, and carefully documented book. So Gallo doesn't like that. He gets home. He calls Nicholson up. Now, I hear this second hand from Nicholson. He says, what the heck are you giving Horowitz, this loon, a good testimonial for his book? Nicholson responds, Bob, first of all, he's no loon. He's a Harvard grad. Second of all, have you read his book? He says, no. He says, Bob, you better read his book. <laughs> Here's his telephone number. So he gives him my telephone number. Three minutes later, my phone rings. I pick up the phone. This is Gallo. My first thought was, I wonder what the world's leading AIDS virologist is doing, calling somebody that needs a grade 101 level of biological science training, high school level. <laughs> so the first thing he says is, I want to apologize to you for what happened in Vancouver. I thought that was nice. Good way to start. He says, um, I didn't know who you were. Garth filled me in. I understand. He says, I understand you're a humanitarian. I'm a humanitarian just like you. And I have a lot of information. I think I can help you to understand the true origins of AIDS. I said, oh, that's nice. I said, I'm very open to that. So he begins to talk and tells me about his family history. I've heard it a hundred times. I've read it about it. People who know Gallo have heard, heard how he got involved in medicine. And I've got to know this conversation is going to go on for a while. So I've got a little tape recorder by my phone. It's always primed and ready to go. <laughs> so I said, Dr. Gallo, do you mind if we record this conversation? He says, for what purpose? I say, for publication purposes, of course, and I find myself in the role of an investigative reporter. So he thinks about it for a couple seconds, and he says, OK. So I begin to record about another 30 minutes, wherein he lays out his chief objections to my thesis. And I want you to know, after studying those objections, they are completely and utterly bogus, scientifically indefensible, and I've got the hard documents to prove that. He would be laughed out of any scientific symposium inquiry into the issue. Next is, when I press him, because I know the theory is sound, I press him on it, and there's this thing about Gallo, everybody knows it, he himself admits it. He's got medical science's biggest ego. And he's always got to be one up on everyone. So when I press him on it, and I say, but Dr. Gallo, don't you think that something like this was possible, not necessarily in your lab? He says, OK, I do not argue with you. I will not argue with you. It's possible. Then he says, but I could tell you even more plausibly how something like this could have happened by accident at that time. So isn't that nice? More news you're not reading. World leading AIDS expert says the epidemic might have been an accident. Nice. Well, at any rate, I sent them a copy of the book. I said, if you can make any additions or corrections, changes to update and improve the quality or content of this work, I'd be happy to integrate it into the next edition. Moreover, if you can tell me more plausibly how the AIDS virus might have evolved, then I certainly would be interested, as I'm sure so would 30 million other HIV AIDS patients throughout the world. Well, I never heard back from him until <clears throat> I called him about a month ago. And I'll tell you in a minute what he said. I want you to know that virtually everything that you know about the AIDS epidemic is a complete deception. In fact, I want you to know that virtually everything you know about everything is a complete deception. <laughs> That's true. And just to give you an example, to introduce this most horrifying segment where I'm going to share with you how the vaccine was developed that most plausibly delivered AIDS to the world and who did it. Just to give you a sense of how deceived you have been, you remember the phrase the AIDS virus doesn't discriminate. And the propaganda message is that you and I are to believe that white people get it as much as black people. 
that gay get it just get as much as straight, that rich versus poor, people all over the world, Africans, same as other countries, Europeans. Well, you remember a couple years ago they even said that white women age 23 to 35 were the fastest growing risk group for HIV AIDS infection. How many remember hearing that? That's wonderful CDC propaganda, a complete distortion of the data. They twist the data, deliver it as a political message, therefore it becomes bogus science. Garbage. This is what they do. They take it out of context. Now, just to give you, present this point a little bit more clearly, I want you to know that the AIDS virus discriminates. I want you to know that the AIDS virus discriminates even in the high-risk populations. To prove my point, I'll take this from the American Journal of Public Health. This is one of thousands of studies that you can evaluate this information, the same information in. And this is a study of HIV antibody prevalence among IV drug abusers in six U.S. regions. Now, with IV drug use, what are you told? You're told that the risk is the bloody needles, aren't you? You share those bloody needles, you get a little blood transferred, virus transferred, you got AIDS. Now here, take a look at this. The, in blue is the percentage of people who share their bloody needles. In red are the people who are positive because of it, allegedly. Now, you see in San Antonio, Texas, 99% of those people who use IV drugs share their bloody works. In other words, these are the dumbest IV drug users in the country. Okay? But despite that mess of ignorance, only 2% carry the AIDS virus. That's interesting. You know, same level of ignorance almost in San Francisco, where it jumps up to 10%. And you see in Baltimore, Maryland, all of a sudden it jumps up to 29%. So that, you know, any epidemiologist with any remaining common sense, now I know that in Epidemiology 101, that's one of the prerequisites. You have to give up your common sense. <laughs> but anyone with any remaining common sense might think, well, maybe something strange was happening in New York. What might that be? And you see here in Denver, it drops down again. And here you have in Tampa, Florida, far smarter IV drug users, far less share their bloody needles. No. Nobody's carrying the AIDS virus there. But look in New York. The Big Apple where you've got the smartest IV drug users in the United States. They all must have gone to Rockefeller University. <laughs> but despite that massive intelligence, a whooping 61% carry the AIDS virus. Now, anyone with any common sense would have to suggest, well, what? Something strange might have been happening in New York. What was happening in New York? And particularly, what was happening in New York, let's say, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years before the AIDS epidemic broke in 78 in New York City? Well, what was happening in New York? This is a United States government document. You're looking at a document from the National Cancer Institute monograph of 1974. We're in over New York City. You see what a square, that square is over also. Central Africa, Uganda. And that square, according to the legend here, is liver cancer virus research. Liver cancer virus research they're studying. And you see herpes, herpes type viruses. There's a star. The stars are in northwest Uganda, which is where Litton Bionetics Research Labs are in collaboration with the International Association for Research in Cancer. And in southeast Uganda, another star for herpes type viruses. That's where Lytton Bionetics' monkey colonies were. And you see the same star over Bethesda, Maryland, where Lytton Bionetics Research Labs were in the United States. Herpes B viruses. By the way, how many of you remember late 70s, all of a sudden, you saw herpes becoming a big deal? Front page of Time and Mag Look Magazine. You said, you know, herpes is a sexually transmitted disease, and who did they blame? They blamed the hippies. You know, the love generation. And then also, uh, herpes viruses, by the way, include simian cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr viruses, herpes B viruses, which now have been linked to sarcoma cancer development, and definitively, chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, which of course, coincidentally, came out on planet Earth in 1978 in humans the same exact year that the AIDS epidemic broke. Interesting. Now you're going to see how this happened. So these people wanted to study. This horrifying story goes back to 1965. 
when Saul Krugman from the New York University Medical Center. Where did you see that word? New York University Medical Center. Right, on the congressional record. You pass. You all fail. <laughs> Another documented biological weapons contractor for the Department of Defense, Lytton Bionetics and New York University Medical Center. There, a fellow by the name of Saul Krugman, who was being paid by the Army to investigate hepatitis B viruses, which he believed, and his colleagues did too, were cancer viruses. That besides liver cirrhosis and liver inflammation, this cancer virus would cause, would, would cause liver cancer. So he wanted to study this in a human population. Trouble is, how many fools do you know are going to volunteer for this? Not too many. So these people covertly volunteer a very unique human population. Try Willowbrook State School mentally retarded children on Staten Island in New York. And in 1965, these people began to inoculate children at Willowbrook with these hepatitis B viruses. And of course, many of the children died. And over the five-year period, 65 to 70, Saul Krugman and his colleagues had tried various heat-treated vaccines on these kids. And if they tried it and the kids died, their attitude was, oh, shucks, we'll just have to heat it up a little bit more and try it again. And that research continued to 1970, when he felt that he was close to developing a vaccine to prevent hepatitis. And he now hands the project over to the world's leading vaccine developer for the world's largest pharmaceutical company in the world, Merck, Sharp, and Dome, which, by the way, have direct connections to IG Farben and the Third Reich. So Maurice Hilleman, Maurice Hilleman is the fellow who Robert Gallo tells me about when I call him several weeks ago. He says, after having read the book, have you heard the good news? I said, no, I haven't. He says, you know that fellow you, who you heavily implicate in your book, Emerging Viruses, Agent Ebola, Maurice Hilleman? I said, yes. He says, well, President Clinton has just announced he's about to reward Hilleman with a Presidential Medal of Honor for his service to American medical science and military science. My response was, I'm sure Hilleman's elated. Here's Hilleman's story. So Hilleman takes over from Krugman, wants to expand the study to include 200,000 human doses of the 1974 experimental hepatitis B vaccine. To do that, you need a lot of help and a lot of viruses. So who does he get to help him? Why his good friends and colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control. Why, you know those disease cowboys, those disease busters who are, you know, putting their lives on the line to help you by going to the Ebola region of Zaire and, you know, without gloves and masks. They're going through the forest, picking up animals all over the place and insects without gloves and masks, looking for the Ebola virus. Right, I'll believe that. But yet most people do when they see that on television, like CNN showed that. And they get the disease people from the Food and Drug Administration, the infectious disease people from the FDA. You know who those people are, don't you? Those are the wonderful people who want to regulate your botanicals and healing herbs and take your vitamins off the market or standardize them at least in accordance with now a new set of regulations coming around us from the backside through GATT Treaty from the World Health Organization, the Rockefeller-funded World Health Organization, you see, where now, a couple years ago, we defeated the efforts to take our vitamins away from us because our movie stars got involved? Well, over the next couple years, you will find that it's not going to be so easy. Because this time, they're going to come at you with GATT sanctions, international sanctions. They will take against the United States if we do not fall into line. That's how they've done it and are doing it now. So the FDA, these wonderful people who want to do all this to our vitamins, and if you're able to get vitamins after this goes into effect, like, for example, a good multivitamin should have at least 200 to 400 international units of vitamin E. Good D-alpha tocopherol, you know, not mixed, not manufactured, not synthetic, but pure. You, if you will get that, you will have to pay probably 10 to 20 times as much, and you'll have to have a physician. You'll have to go see the doctor for a signature on that. That's what's in the works right now. These are the people who 
put on the fast track for testing and approval, AZT, 3TC, protease inhibitors, DDI, DZC, which most plausibly are killing far more people than the AIDS viruses. But they want to pull your vitamins off yourselves. So they get the FDA and the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases. Then these three government agencies, along with Merck, Sharp, and Dome, the world's leading pharmaceutical company, develop 200,000 human doses in four lots of a contaminated hepatitis B vaccine. Now, here's how they did it. They tried to grow enough viruses. They need a lot of viruses, I told you. They tried to grow these viruses in the children. It wouldn't work. Oh, couldn't grow enough in the kids. They then tried to grow it in cell culture. Wouldn't grow there either. They needed something live to grow it in. So they ultimately, they ultimately selected rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees. Heavily contaminated rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees supplied by Litton Bionetics researchers. How do I know that? Well, I've got their contract. Now, how do we know that they were contaminated? Well, these researchers themselves said that 70% of their caged laboratory animals were environmentally contaminated with hepatitis B viruses and a whole sortment of other viruses, which we know now included cytomegalo, Epstein-Barr, the herpes type viruses, and another unique enzyme associated virus, reverse transcriptase associated virus, that unique enzyme that makes the AIDS virus sick, was in a virus also there in simian foamy retroviruses that were also contaminated in these animals. So here's how they made the vaccine now. They grew the hepatitis B viruses in these contaminated animals. When they had grown enough, they extracted the viruses out of them. Now, when you extract a live virus out of a live contaminated animal, all of the other viral contaminants come with it. And now they inoculated this entire viral mishmash, this mixture, into the children, into the gay men in New York City, and into the blacks in Central Africa, Eastern Zaire, and Northwest Uganda. Now, of course, many of these people died, but the ones that lived had developed antibodies. It was these people who lived whose blood they took. And they shipped the blood to Merck Sharp and Dome Laboratory, where they separated the serum from the whole cell fractions. And it was from that serum, that heavily contaminated serum. And also, to make it even worse, these people had 10 years previously get, received the Salk and Sabin vaccines, which were heavily contaminated with monkey viruses. So they were human incubation chambers, like at least 25% of this audience with monkey viruses in their human bodies. And so they took their blood, and it was from this that they made the first four lots of 1974 experimental hepatitis B vaccine containing 200,000 human doses that they then inoculated once again in the different regions of the world, principally New York and Central Africa. Now this, what I've just told you, to make a long story short, I could spend an hour explaining it, literally is the only theory that has been advanced so far on the origin of AIDS that reconciles and integrates all of the scientific, documented, and confirmed facts. Now, why can I stand before you so clear and so uh, sure of what I'm telling you is the gospel? Well, because I found the contracts. I found the contracts. You know how I found the contracts? God's grace. Amen. The story, real quick, I'll end it here. In fact, what you're looking at here is the contract under which numerous AIDS like and Ebola like viruses were developed. You see, then this is Robert C. Gallo from the project officer from the National Cancer Institute. Here's Robert Ting. See, John Landon was director of Bionetics Research Labs. National Institute of Health contract number 712025. It was entitled The Investigation of Viral Carcinogenesis in Primates. That's cancer production through viral infection in monkeys and humans. And you look at the date that they started, those in the front can see, February 12, 1962. And you see how much they were paid was $2.153 million. Oh, there it is. It's upside down. Sorry about that. That fell out the other day. 2.153 million dollars. That's what is on the contract summary report. 2.153 million dollars. Now, that document reconciled the document that initiated my investigation. Because remember when we began, I said to you that it was the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council in 1969, 
inform the Department of Defense that for $2 million a year over five years they could develop these immune system ravaging microorganisms for germ warfare. Remember I said that? Yeah. How was it, you might ask, that the National Academy of Sciences knew that it would take $2 million over five years, $2 million every year for five years to do this work? How did they know? They had obviously just done it. Now, this information God wants to come out. How do I know that for certain? Because it was only this way that I found these contracts. I thought I was done. You know how sometimes you think you're done and God thinks something else? So I thought I was done with this investigation. I'm on my way home. My wife and I and my little baby, we were a two-year-old, Elena. We're on our way back from Florida, driving to New York, and what happens is that I, get, I call New York ahead of time, who was supposed to do a seminar. They canceled the seminar because they had painted the auditorium and they didn't want to intoxicate the audience. So they canceled the seminar, gave me two days down. I, we decided to go to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Davis Library, and my wife and the baby could tittle around in the town. It was a beautiful spring day, the flowers, blossoms were coming out, and I would go to the library. So I go to the library to get two congressional records references. That's it. That's all I need, and I'm done, I figure. So I get a library pass to the government documents office. I go to the library. There's a big librarian there. He's six foot three. He's about 300 pounds. This guy's got a sophisticated layer, air of library science all about him, you know? <laughs> so I show him my pass. I said, well, I wonder if you could help me. Here's my references. I need to get these two congressional records. He says, follow me. So he darts off, and this guy's fast like a, a linebacker. And I'm following him flying through a set of doorways, down a hall, down a flight of steps. I'm now 10 yards behind him, and all of a sudden I hear a voice that says, stop, as loud as though I'm speaking to you now. Stop, turn right. <laughs> okay. And now I got a problem, you see. Because this guy looks over, he says, hey, where are you going? Um, don't mind me, I'm just going to have a look over here. This voice says, walk. Uh, he says, no, 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 your congressional records are over here. I say, don't mind me, I'm just going to have a quick look over here. He says, no, 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 your congressional records are this way. I said, look, I'm just going to have a quick look over here, just don't mind, I won't do anything wrong. He says, that's not how you do research. You get your citation and you look it up. I say, fine, I hear this voice, I say, just walk. I said, fine, thank you, I'm just going to have a quick look over here. I hear, I hear this voice say, walk, I'm walking. It says, he, sa he says, okay, he gets frustrated, he says, okay, I'll go get your congressional records. So I now, I'm walking, I'm following this voice. It says, walk, slow, stop, I stop. It says, turn left. It says, walk. I'm now walking down an aisle of about 70, 60, 70 yards long, eight foot high stacks on both sides, hundreds of thousands of volumes on both sides. This voice says, walk, I'm walking. It says, slow, it says, slow, stop. Look down, left, knee high. I look down, left, left, knee high. There are the words, special virus cancer program. Project reports, 1971, pop into my face. I said, I think I found what I'm looking for. <laughs> I opened this thing up. It just happened to open up the thumb, okay, miracle. Open up, Litton Bionetics Research Project re Summary Reports contained all of the names, all of the organizational structure, the affiliations, the academic affiliations, what they did, when they did it, how they did it, including how much U.S. taxpayer money they paid. We paid for it. Our parents paid for it. So I want to share with you that this is all part of a great plan, and I'm privileged gift, just it is such a blessing and a gift for me to be able to be here today and share this information with you. I believe that because of your prayers and the prayers of tens of thousands of people all over this world, I am still here to share this information. Because many of you have thought, you know, you know, aren't you afraid for your life? Aren't they, how come you're still alive, Horowitz? You know, a better question, higher quality question, because it's the questions that we ask ourselves at any given moment. The quality of the questions determine the quality of the outcomes that we are able to produce in life. So the higher quality question in this regard is, what is the risk to one human being or one career in comparison to the potential benefit to humanity for bringing this information out and sharing it with others? 
So thank you. Thank you.